often omitted from the streamlined story of civil rights movement and overshadowed by such compelling figures as Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, Byron Rustin was the man in John Emilio's stirring biography, The Lost Prophet. We're here in San Francisco at the Modern Times Bookstore, where Mr. D'Amelio presented uh, his thoughts and his take on the life and times of Byron Rustin. Please watch. I really wanted to write about the 1960s. Um, I wanted to write about the 60s because the country was getting more and more conservative, and to look, to sort of jump back into the 60s was my personal antidote to depression every morning and newspaper headlines. Um, you know, it's this period of time where you could sense that, well, okay, here is an era in American life where truth and justice really were marching forward uh, and large numbers of people were taking action to make the world a more decent place. And it was out of that impulse to write about the 60s and also to find a different entry point that I came upon Rustin's life. Here, if there's any event in the 60s that symbolizes hope, you know, that's like a great day in American history, it was the March on Washington in 1963. And Rustin is the person as responsible as anyone for getting 250,000 people to show up in Washington, D.C. that morning and afternoon and making it the event that has become iconic in American history. He, he was a radical's radical. Uh, when you start the 60s, there are all these college students who are coming to a political awakening, but Rustin has already been there for a generation and, and brings a wealth of experience to these enlarging social movements in the 60s and, and a commitment and a courage that was absolutely undeniable if you, if you look back on his earlier life. Rustin wrote this piece um, called From Protest to Politics that was his manifesto to both the civil rights movement and the American left, in which he was saying, in effect, we are so much stronger than we have ever been before. We have to move beyond an outlook and a strategy that just has us in the streets all the time protesting, and we have to really begin thinking about how we take power how we inject ourselves into the heart of the political system so that we're not always the outsiders, you know, screaming in while other people keep making the decisions. He, um, you know, he's a pacifist during a period of time when few people were able to speak about it, and he helped create the transition to a more vibrant and public pacifist movement. He was one of the group of people who starts an organization called the Congress of Racial Equality. The, the work that he did, both as a pacifist and as a Gandhian activist in, in the black freedom struggle, put Rustin in a position so that in the mid-50s, when northern activists start hearing about this amazing thing that's happening in the deep south community of Montgomery, Alabama, this community-wide <laughs> bus boycott, this, you know, is like Rustin's been waiting his life for something like this to happen. He goes down to Montgomery. He establishes a very close and important relationship with Martin Luther King. Um, I think one of the arguments in my book that's different from what other people have written is that I, I think his influence on King was actually much more profound and deep than anybody has actually yet acknowledged. That it's, it's Rustin who transforms King into a Gandhian, and it's Rustin who strategizes how this local leader with charismatic powers can actually become a national leader with a national platform. Now, at the same time that this is happening, you know, that this story of political activism is unfolding, that an agitator for justice is finding his way, there's another story that's going on simultaneously. And it's the story of how a gay man who was remarkably open for that generation, how he had to navigate the homophobia of that generation as his sexuality and his sexual identity kept erupting into view. And, uh, and so I think there's a message of hopefulness in Rustin's uh, life. The gods do not require that we succeed, but they do require that we just keep trying.
This month, David Neyman and I cover some rather interesting topics in films. I get to handle seducing Mormon missionary boys from Pocatello, Idaho. Isn't that where Judy Garland is from? Pretty close. Mm. And David here gets the transgendered and aging senior citizen sex pots. <laughs> David, you get, you get the first serve. Well, in 1968, Gore Vidal's best-selling novel, Myra Breckenridge, poked wild, raunchy fun at the era's sexual revolution. The 1970 film version of the book has become one of the most notorious films in Hollywood history. Myra Breckenridge is now on DVD from 20th Century Fox and is the film industry's first and to date only major studio film to deal with transgenderism. Now in 1970, star Mae West may have been deluding herself. She was no longer a star and she sure as hell wasn't desirable. <laughs> uh, take a look at this clip. It's easy to spell and just as easy to do. We've got the S-M-I-L-E. It's gonna help consider briefly. Just keep your chin up and give it a try. And you'll find silver lined clouds in the sky. Well, the end of another busy day. I can't wait till I get back to bed. If that don't work, I'll try and sleep. Mm, hi, cowboy. How tall are you without your horse? Well, ma'am, I'm six feet seven inches. Well, <clears throat> never mind about the six feet. Let's talk about the seven inches. Mm -hmm. Oh, Raymond, you gotta hand it to a 77-year-old woman who's still willing to flaunt her sexuality. God bless Mae West. Now, in retrospect, Myra, Myra Breckenridge appears to be a film ahead of its time. Raquel Welch showed great courage in handling the title role, a transgendered female on a quest for sexual liberation and revenge on the male species. The film is a giddy farce, X-rated on its original release, and was considered quite shocking in its day. Take a look at this clip. The point is, Mrs. Breckenridge, that no record of your husband's death exists in New York City or state. Steve, I... Yes, remember, Get my, these people see. don't screw around. Everything's legal and above board, not like in some places I can mention south of the border down Mexico way. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I say the man's dead, you are mitigated. And that means he's dead. Oh, I'll admit his body was never found, that's true. He died in a car accident outside the Bank of America. Burr! Beverly Hills branch. There is not one iota of evidence that he is dead, and we are not going to pay you one single penny. Steve, right? Randolph, I believe the moment of truth has finally arrived. Go get him. Gentlemen, I am Myron Breckenridge. Uncle Buck, your fag nephew, became your niece two years ago in Copenhagen and is now free as a bird and happy in being the most extraordinary woman in the world. <laughs> and I thought I'd fell in love with a man. <laughs> That's the ball game. Now, reportedly, the filming of Myra Breckenridge was a nightmare. Everybody on the film hated each other and the director. Mae West and Raquel Welch, who had scenes together, refused to appear in the same shots together. On her commentary track for the DVD, Raquel Welch tells the truth. This was the worst experience of her career, but after 35 years, she's able to laugh about it. And her commentary is absolutely the most brilliant, funniest commentary I have ever heard on a DVD. This film is a giddy farce. It is hilarious. People have hated it for years. I love it. I think it's worthy of a second look. Myra well, Breckenridge. Well, you can keep your DVD and the seven inches along with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's only for cult fans. <laughs> anyway, on to our next film. Uh, the subject of our theatrical film from TLA releasing is a bit near and dear to my heart. Sexually repressed gay Mormons. Nice to look at, but never emotionally available. Latter Days is a gay romantic film about a sexually confused Mormon missionary who moves next door to a superficial pretty boy gym bunny. So, Openly gay Joseph muscle Smith, boy Christian God wages a $50 bet with his Jesus friends Christ. that he can put the missionary yes. elder into the missionary position and bring back Any his questions? sacred Mormon undergarments as proof. No. 
How come if God talks to Joseph Smith, he's a prophet, but if God talks to me, I'm schizophrenic? Uh, well, he was sort of special. What's the Mormon church's stand on black people? That's a good question. Um, African American members have been allowed to hold the priesthood since 1978. Since disco. And women? Women don't get to hold the priesthood. What they get is to be wives and to be mothers and share in its blessings. Huh, sharing. See? Sharing is good. Christian here was wondering, what is your church's stand on gay rights? Um, well... There's no such thing. Gay and right don't belong in the same sentence. Oh, but right and right wing go hand in hand. Yeah, God hates homos. You're gonna come into my house and tell me God hates homosexuals? And the French. God hates the French. Everybody hates the French. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly who converts whom is up for debate as the newly defrocked Aaron comes to terms with his sexuality and the bed-hopping Christian comes to terms with his falling in love with Aaron. Sports. Fairies. Oh, how seventh grade. Why don't we just play two on two? But you're... A girl, so I can't play. But then I am black, so maybe I can. Your only problem is deciding which one of your narrow-minded stereotypes can kick your lily white ass. Which <laughs> you could be. By a girl and a bag. We mop you like a dirty floor. Fine. Wear shirts. Your skins. The lead role is played by Steven Sandvoss in his debut performance, and he puts in a magnificent uh, performance in this role. David, what did you think of this film? Well, in your opening, you refer to it as romantic, and I think that's the key word. It's romantic. I'm not going to reveal the ending, but it is a very romantic, happy ending. I loved it, mm. and they were gorgeous. Well, some parts were a little bit cliched, wasn't, weren't they? Um, like that one scene at the airport, that, that was a little bit cliched, you thought? I thought it, I don't know about cliched, I thought it got a little heavy-handed at times when they got into the, the Mormon aspects of, of, uh, of the film, the, the Mormonism, that was a little heavy-handed. But it was sweet and romantic, they were gorgeous, I was rooting for them. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Mormon friends of mine have told me that it's rather accurate, um, all, the, all the restrictions that they have, like no caffeine, no wine, etc., and all and all that. Um, I found the scenes when he was in the hospital being cured, I found those scenes really disturbing. Mm -hmm. And I'm shocked that this is still going on. Yeah, that's reparative therapy and they, they still do that to this day. I think that should be outlawed. I c couldn't believe that in the 21st century they were torturing somebody like that. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, anyway, the film opens nationwide in all towns except Salt Lake City. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder yeah, why. <laughs> <of course. laughs> Back to you guys.